meeting. Uh, it's Tuesday, April 5th, 2022. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heather, would you please take the roll call? Councilmember Bachman. Here. Mayor Beaton. Here. Councilmember Lundberg. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Here. Councilmember Shemansky. Here. Councilmember Grabowski. Here. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Here. City Manager. Here. City Attorney. Here. DPW Director. Here. Finance Director. Here. Police Chief. Here. Fire Chief. Here. City Engineer. Here. Roll call complete. Thank you, Helen. <clears throat> this is time for citizen comments on agenda related items. This is an opportunity for citizens to comment on agenda related items only. Citizens in attendance shall be recognized by the mayor for comments limited to five minutes. Letters submitted to council will not be publicly read. Do I have anybody from the public who would like to step forward? I would, please. Please state your name and address. My name is Kathy Grabowski, and I live at 1235 Cornell Street in Manistee. And the reason I'm here today is because um, I would like to get on the beautification committee. Um, I was asked to be on the ad hoc blight committee because no one from our district was um, applying for it. So I did. I said, sure, I'll give it a try. And it uh, turned out that it worked out really well. Um, we did a good job, I think. Um, we got things going, got things accomplished. Josh helped us out a lot. Um, at the same time, we kind of had the Manistee Proud going with Kelly, Gravy, and uh, it, it just seemed that Manistee was making a turn to be a better community, a cleaner community, something more welcoming. Um, I knew that the ad hoc committee was for a limited time, and I know this is not a continuation, but it's still the new committee uh, is dealing with a lot of the same issues. I feel that if you were on the ad hoc Blake committee for two years, and now you're applying for the new restoration committee, it should be taken into consideration. Um, Kelly and I never missed a meeting. At the end, her and I and Josh were the only two left. With the COVID and everything and people doing other things, everybody dropped out but us. And we stuck it out to the end because we cared. I feel that I'm qualified. Um, I was born and raised in Manistee on the north side of the river on Lincoln Street. Um, I graduated from Manistee High School. I got encouraged by my son and my husband to go later to college where I earned an associate's degree in marketing and management. I worked 30 years at the credit union, the West Michigan Credit Union. There I dealt with loans, mortgages, equities, and learned a lot about things going on in Manistee. And the biggest accomplishment was to get our young people into their first home. I was always taught to be civic-minded by my father, who ran the Gulf gas station by the post office when it was there. He uh, always let the kids come and have their car washes for school events. My family's big with the Knights of Columbus. We were family of the year for the Special Olympics, for uh, the Tootsie Roll Drive. My husband and I taught class at the St. Mary's Catholic Church for the children. 
We worked through the Elks Fish Fry and Bingo. I know now I'm a co-facilitator of the Grief Share at Faith Covenant Church. I worked grad bash when my son was a senior in high school. I've gone back in our day door to door for the March of Dimes, the Cancer Society, where I was a regional neighborhood manager. And I feel I'm just as qualified to do it. I'm already on it, the other committee, and I ask you to please consider me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have anybody else who'd like to come forward? Please state your name and address. My name is John McCracken, and my address is 4111 Imperial Drive in Walker. That's a community northwest of Michigan. I'm on the back end of bronchitis, so please forgive me if I cough. I do not have COVID. I've been tested. So I just want to give you the heads up on that. I, as well, have applied to the NRBC, and I think I've emailed all of our council members at this point. Um, I don't think I have to go into detail about what a wonderful community the city of Mayoste is, um, but it can be better. It really discourages me to see broken windows, boarded up windows, or burnt out houses that we have in our community. Um, through the process of another property purchase at 269 5th uh, Street on the east side of 31, I think some of you are familiar with that property, um, I had the opportunity to meet our city manager, Bill Gamble. And whether he knows it or not, he kind of put the wheels in motion of my head. Uh, Bill's a young guy. I am not so young anymore, but he's raising his family here. And that's just a wonderful opportunity to be able to come here and make a name for yourself, but to have a family here. But the, the blight that I'm seeing in, in, in Manistee, is this, this city could be so, so much better. And um, I was tickled pink. Through Bill, I was able to meet Linda. I spoke with Jermaine, uh, Cindy at our last council meeting, and some of the other people about what was going on, and I learned about the NRBC. Um, nobody wants blight in this community, and nobody needs it, but not everybody has the, the financial means to address that. So if I'm appointed a part of the NRBC, I'd like to find out how to help out those people that don't have the financial means to, to fix some of these things, but also the people that do have the financial means to support them with the processes to get them to kind of clean things up around here. Um, through uh, Mayor Beaton, I found out about the charter here and I read through some of the bullet points and it's pretty much everything that I am about. Um, I'm a community activist. I volunteer at the Elks. We're members there. We have two properties in Manistee that we've restored or we've addressed at this point. To be a part of this team for me is personally just a wonderful opportunity. I'm at the juncture in my life where uh, I have the, the desire and I have the time to make an impact here. I'd like to see Manistee grow, and I'd like to provide a means for the people that, like I said before, don't have the financial means to help make Manistee more beautiful. Um, that's, that's all I got for you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I have a few more minutes yet. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say, lastly, that I would love to work with Kathleen Grabowski as well. I think that would be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Do I see anybody else who would like to come forward and make public comment at this time? Seeing none. All right, we're, we're moving on. Consent agenda. All agenda items marked with an asterisk are on the consent agenda and considered by the city manager to be routine matters. Prior to the approval of the consent agenda, any member of council may have an item from the consent agenda removed and taken up during the regular portion of the meeting. Consent agenda items include approval of minutes, cash balances, revenue and expenses, notification regarding next study session, consideration of proclaiming April as Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month, 
consideration of the, two, uh, the 2022 Manistee National Forest Festival events, consideration of a temporary activity permit for the Wizards Fireworks to have a fireworks stand in front of 115 Cypress Street. At this time, council could take action to approve the consent agenda as presented. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll second. Thank you. All right. You ready for a roll call vote? Yes, please. Council Member Bachman. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Council Member Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Council Member Shemansky. Yes. Council Member Grabowski. Yes. Council Member Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. <clears throat> There's no unfinished business. Moving on to new business. Consideration of awarding a contract for the demolition and removal of the secondary storage tank cover at the wastewater treatment plant. Damage occurred to the secondary digester storage cover this winter during sludge removal. The cover is damaged beyond repair and requires replacement. The removal and replacement costs are covered by insurance. Bids for the cover removal were publicly advertised with one bid being received. Zubin Industrial LLC, $63,075. Engineer's Estimate, $65,000. This agreement has been reviewed and approved by the city attorney. At this time, council could take action to award a contract to Zubin Industrial LLC in the amount of $63,075 and authorize the mayor and the city clerk to execute the documents. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? I have one question. Uh, is this contract for the replacement as well as the demolition? This is just for the removal of the existing lid. The engineers are in the process of designing a new cover to be put in place. And we didn't want to wait and do it as a package because we have to, we're at our limit of storage for sludge right now. So once council awards us in the next week or two, um, we will have a company come in and, and remove all the sludge, clean the tanks in preparation for the removal. And then, um, then we will be also bidding out the new tank cover. Okay, thank you. So it's all covered by insurance? Yes. You know what the cover comes up to at all, Jim? Excuse me? You know what the new replacement cover is going to cost? Do you know what the estimated cost? Not top of my head. Any more questions? Why did we only get one uh, bid? Is that just because it's a complicated thing and there's only certain people can do it? Or is there? The, before we, before we understood that the full implication of how emergent this was. Um, we, the engineer started, first of all, we had an engineer do an investigation to determine why the cover failed. Um, after that, we submitted it to the insurance company as a claim. And then the engineers also started reaching out to various contractors, getting estimates on what those costs would be. The, um, the insurance came back and said, yes, we'll cover it. We decided that the time frame allowed us to competitively bid it as opposed to doing this as an emergency. And uh, so I think some of the availability and some of the pricing with the contractors were kind of known. Um, and, but this ended up being the lowest bid and the lowest one of all the estimates that were given to us prior. What did cause the damage to it? So the, the cover is very unique. Most of the covers and the one that we will put back is a fixed cover um, and it, it really just maintains um, the sludge from giving off odors to the atmosphere, you know, anybody around. However, when this cover was designed and it's the original one to the plant, so it's um, what, almost 40 some years old. So it's over 40 years old. When this one was designed, it was designed to capture the methane gas 
which is a byproduct of the, the bio um, digestion. And that gas was actually piped into part of the plant and then burned in a boiler to heat part of the process. Um, some time ago, 15 years ago or so, um, that process was removed because it was very maintenance heavy and very expensive to replace the corrosiveness of that gas process. So now it's piped with just straight natural gas. So any of the methane that's captured off of this is simply uh, burned off on a flare down at the plant. But to get to the answer of your question, the cover floats. So as material fills that and as gas um, enters the chamber, the cover actually floats on the gas and that maintains a constant pressure to feed the, bo to feed the previous boiler. So when the cover or when the tank is emptied, the cover then rides back down on, on slides and wheels. And for some reason that cover pinched as, and then as the uh, liquid went down, it fell, f the entire cover fell about three to four feet. And just that force um, dimpled the top of it and it will no longer ride on the guides anymore. Do you check that every week or something so you know when it is? Uh, they do monthly checks on it. And we actually just repainted this cover and fully rehabbed it about two years ago. Um, but everything is in work, was in working condition. Um, there's, in my career, so in the past 30 years, there's probably been three times where this thing has had major issues um, and had to be worked on. Uh, this time it was significant enough where it can't be reused though. Thank you, Jeff. Anybody else? I think we're ready for a vote. Council Member Martin Pontiac. Yes. Council Member Grabowski. Yes. Council Member Shemansky. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Council Member Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Council Member Bachman. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Consideration of a Michigan Department of Transportation 2023 Category B grant application. The Michigan Department of Transportation administers a grant program to assess, assess, I'm sorry, to assist with paving local streets for communities with populations of less than 10,000. The maximum grant amount is $250,000 with a 50-50 match. The city has identified the First Street Beach Loop, Lakeside, Lakeshore Drive as an eligible street segment with proposed utility work. This project is already planned in the proposed transportation improvement program for 2023 construction and will utilize the project as match money. The grant application amount is $195,500. At this time, council could take action to adopt a resolution to establish a request for funds, provide the required grant match, designate Jeff, Jeffrey W. McCullough as the designated agent and agree to future maintenance on the project. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. A second. Discussion? <coughs> yep, I know that street is really bad. You got a lot of holes <coughs> in the place. <coughs> Would it be simpler just to uh, try to chop that asphalt up and repave it or? <coughs> yeah, as I tried to explain in the memo, this project is already planned right. for next year. So um, in conjunction with some of the developer um, improvements down at First Street, we are planning to repave the majority of the loop in the parking area, the, just the adjacent parking areas at First Street Beach. Um, because this is a planned project and we do have some local money that's going into it, um, specifically the uh, Brownfield tax capture, we chose this project uh, because it's one of the local streets that we've got planned for next year. And the category B um, is something we apply for every year. They're super competitive. Every community has local streets that need to be done. So it's kind of like trying to win the lottery. Um, but whether or not we get the grant, the project's gonna go forward. Um, in fact, we just met with the development team and uh, we plan on having 
uh, this work done between March and June of next spring. Until then, we'll just have to keep patching the potholes down there, but it, it was, it's pretty beat up after this winter. Yeah. So if we don't get the grant, um, are we gonna pay the whole 99,000? Plus what you got in the fund? Correct. Yeah, if we get the grant, that just saves some of the local money that we would invest in it, and we can use that for the next project then. And this doesn't include any parking, it's just the road? This is just for the road, well, it's just for the roadway. So if you, if you think of the, especially on the South Loop at First Street Beach, the pavement width is very wide. And historically there was a bike lane and then kind of parallel <coughs> parking along that. Right. In the last few years, we've moved that bike lane and striped it with parallel parking on both sides of it. Um, part of the Hampton Inn's obligation is to also add more uh, 20 spaces of public parking in that area. Um, we're going to take that full pavement width and we're going to expand the 20 spaces that uh, the development is committed to, but we're also going to add more angles, angle parking. So we think that just by restriping and re-laying out the asphalt that's there, we can add quite a bit more parking in addition to the 20 spaces, plus give a new drive lane to the, to the entire loop. And that'll still be like parking around the other side where the, the little park is, right? They'll be on both sides. Both sides okay. Yep. And this also adds um, some curb and gutter right above the, um, the lower parking lot at the end of First Street mm -hmm. where we have a lot of water issues right. and erosion. Um, and also uh, would rebuild the lower or repave the lower parking lot. Um, that's pretty beat up. We're going to try to tip it to control the drainage a little bit better. Um, so there's quite a few improvements. Okay, that would be included in this? This is all in that project. Okay. Yep. How uh, optimistic are you about that grant? Uh, it's, I mean, you're buying a lottery ticket. Okay. When do you find out? You know when they announce? May or June. Okay. Any other council members have any questions? Heather, will you please take the roll call? Councilmember Shemansky. Yes. Councilmember Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Councilmember Bachman. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Consideration of accepting a grant award to support the construction of a disc golf course at First Street Beach. The city successfully applied for a Mingler Foundation grant from the Manistee County Community Foundation. The grant amount is $22,500 and will be spent to acquire equipment and materials to support the new public amenity. The city attorney has reviewed and approved the agreement. At this time, council could take action to accept the Manistee County Community Grant and authorize the city manager to execute the agreement. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Okay. Discussion? Looks pretty cool. <laughs> it looks really nice. We actually just broke ground on it this morning. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. We'll call vote, please. <laughs> Councilmember Bachman. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Shemansky. Yes. Councilmember Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Consideration of approving the Smoke on the Water special event. Salt City Rock and Blues LLC is requesting to host a Smoke on the Water special event at Douglas Park Saturday, July 16th, 2022. The event will include a Deep Purple tribute band and several local bands. Marijuana consumption will be available with a cord off and well-defined area, not accessible to persons under 21 of age. Alcoholic beverages will also be available for purchase. Proceeds of the event 
will be used to continue efforts to build an ample theater for First Street Beach. At this time, Council could take action to approve the July 16, 2022 Smoke on the Water special event and authorize the consumption of marijuana on public property in a controlled area in accordance with MCL 333.27951E and City Ordinance 867.14. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Is anyone here from that group? No. Yes. No. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, the I don't know the Salt City Rock and Blues. Yes. All right. So I just had a couple of questions when I was reading through uh, sort of your finalized stuff in your your area. Do you have like a first aid spot there or anything like that? Is there going to be like a in case anybody? And Bob, if you could come to the mic, that'd be thank you. Thank you. Um, as far as a, we've had uh, CERT in the past who have uh, um, training in the first aid. CERT has said that they won't uh, work at um, any events in the county now that have alcohol at their functions. So. This was something that we'll, we will need to address. Yes, we will, I'm making this uh, the spur of the moment, but we will have first aid there. Um, so I I'd like to guarantee that that would be there. Also, I'd like to make a notification as to uh, what was read. Um, it says marijuana consumption will be available within a cordoned off area and well defined not accessible to persons under 21 years of age. This will be a 21 years and older event only. So there will be no underage people there to begin with. So it'll be 21 and over for the entire event. Okay. okay. Is there, um, is our, uh, what is this? Um, something 321, authentic 321, are they here? Mm -hmm. I was reading in this, um, and I guess I didn't see that before, and I don't know if it was put in there before, but it says edibles and flour will be offered. Is that correct? Yeah. I, I didn't see the edibles before. I know that sometimes edibles can be overconsumed or take, they take too much of that, and that concerns me a little bit. Can you tell me how you will be able to regulate if somebody's using that and not taking 15 grams or whatever versus yeah. five. Um, anything can be overconsumed. Uh, unfortunately, that's kind of up to people what they're going to take. We obviously try to educate people as much as possible when they're buying edibles, um, and we hope that they use discretion and follow recommendations. Because also, doesn't it take anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours to actually fully kick in and that sort of thing? Cause <clears throat> it really depends on the products. I mean, nowadays with nano emulsification, we sell products that uh, take effect in 10 minutes, which allow like e easier dosing than than your typical like. Yeah, if you're you know back in the days, if you made yourself some brownies and you had a stomach full of uh, hot dogs already you might eat a brownie and it takes two hours to work yeah i just with the alcohol and the edibles and the the other stuff that just felt like a lot <laughs> sure i mean we plan to you know we plan to basically um, offer the inventory that's the same inventory that's for sale in our store and and those companies will be there as vendors so well, and you, you can only buy a, t a ticket to enter the, the, the marijuana district or the area that's burned off, or a ticket to buy to be part of the alcohol crowd, is my understanding. Is that correct? Uh, we were not planning to sell separate tickets, no. no the ticket to the event, um, people that would want to partake of um, alcohol would buy a a ticket and then present that ticket for a, a beer or a glass of wine or whatever it might be to partake at the marijuana cordoned off area they would just enter that area okay wouldn't they have to register though uh they do have to register yes so 
Okay. Individuals have to register to go into the marijuana. Okay, that's Just good. like they do going into the store. Like Same procedure. Going into the store, we take their ID, we put it through our scanner. You can't get anybody through with a fake ID. Um, we're, we're very careful about it. It's very, very highly regulated. Any other questions? Um, are you guys paying for the um, dial a ride, or is that you're just having them be available? Um, in years past, when we had uh, Labor Fest, they offered it as a community service. We offered um, several times to make donations to dial a ride that they would not accept because they're a um, government funded entity. So we were un unable to do that. All what we have done is to thank them publicly and to make sure that their services are noticed by the community that they're doing this service for us. But they are going to be available. They are going to be available, definitely. If we could pay them, we would, but, but it's not something that we can do. Okay. Um, I've actually offered Police Chief Glass to um, help with any additional patrol that he needs, he feels like needs to be there on the day, like if he feels like there need to be an extra two or three or four officers that, that he would normally send that we would be willing to foot the bill for that. And I didn't see anything in there about food trucks. Is that something that's completely separate or you're just inviting them to be around or? They're gonna be within the um, cordoned off area. Oh, they are? So, so they will be there. It'll be set up very similar to Labor Fest where we have a fence enclosing the entire area and then within um, that area where the trucks will set up. Um, anticipating having three food trucks right now. Are you still feeling like there's going to be 2,000 people coming to the event? We, I, I don't know. I think it's going to be pretty popular. Um, we want to limit the number, and I had said at the last uh, work session that we would limit it between 1,500 and 2,000. I guess um, we would cap it at a maximum of 2,000 people. And we've had that number or very close to it in um, sub, or previous sessions. One was in 2019 when we had Here Come the Mummies. That was very well attended. And the inaugural event back in 2013 when we had Red Apple Road and Van Dex, we probably had that number as well. In that same area? In that same area. And it's, it's um, crowded, but it's not undoable. To have 3,000 people, that would be something else. But to cap it at 2,000 and maybe Yep, close to that, I think we... Are you going to be able to that. count that and track that? We are going to, we are in the process, yes, we are going to track that. But um, we're hoping that this has such popularity that all the tickets will sell beforehand. We're in the process, um, within the next week or so, we'll have it complete, that our website will be updated. Um, all the tickets to the both events will be sold online through Salt City Rock and Blues, the monies will be deposited directly into our account so that you know third party, which will save us money and save patrons money, and um, we'll be able to uh, clock the number of tickets that are sold each and every day. And so you'll just have a limit and then stop after that. When, when we reach the, if we reach the limit um, with um, advanced tickets, then we'll cut off the sales. If, if we sell a thousand tickets beforehand, we sell, um, a thousand at the gate, then we cut it off. So it will be monitored. How, um, so how far and wide does it reach? Like, is it all of Michigan? Is it other states? I mean, how far? I don't, I'm not thinking that we'll get to other states, but I really do think it will be statewide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if three uh, food trucks is going to be enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm still <clears throat> with my opinion. Uh, I've dealt with this stuff for 50 years. And we just had a shooting in Scottville over marijuana. So, and a guy got killed. So it, it's something I don't really care to see. So I'm not in favor. I think we're ready to take the vote. 
Um, before, oh, I'm sorry. Um, again, uh, although I am in favor, I'm also a member of the Salt City Rock and Blues Board, so I believe I'm going to have to uh, recuse myself from the vote. I suppose that's your choice. I'm not sure that you really need to, but uh... um, I'm. That would be my advice, okay. Madam Mayor. Yeah, he, uh, okay. Councilman Shemansky consulted with me in advance, and I s told him that that would be a conflict, and uh, he should recuse. All right. Yeah. Anybody <clears throat> else? Okay. Roll call. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Bachman? No. Councilmember Grabowski? No. Motion approved. Thank you. Okay. I didn't know, sorry. Um, consideration of commission appointment. Chapter 275, Neighborhood Restoration and Beautification Commission of the City of Manistee Codified Ordinances was established by adoption of ordinance number 22-01 at the March 1st 2022 council meeting. Section 275.02 <clears throat> membership states, one member shall be a city council member appointed by mayor and confirmed by city council. At this time, the mayor could take action to appoint a city council member to the Neighborhood Restoration and Beautification Commission. The mayor is nominating Jermaine Sullivan for the position. We need a motion and a second. We need a motion. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Roll call. Councilmember Bachman. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Schmansky. Yes. Councilmember Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Consideration of applications to boards and commissions. The city clerk has taken action to advertise vacancies on the Compensation Commission, Harbor Commission, Neighborhood Restoration and Beautification Commission, Hay Commission, and Tree Commission. Mayoral and manager appointments require a motion, second, and council voted support. Nominations for council appointments do not need a second. All nominations. After all nominations are made, council votes on the nominees. One nominee receives a majority, until one nominee receives majority vote. The following applications have been received. Neighborhood Restoration and Beautification Commission, four vacancies, two terms ending 4-30-24, two terms ending 4-30-25. Applicants must be city residents or city property owners and at least one applicant <coughs> shall be a representative from a local service club organization, mayoral appointment. Before I begin, is there anything you wanted to say? Uh, Mayor, you asked if I had a recommendation for this uh, commission, and it's very nice to have all these applicants, and I think um, no matter who's selected, it's also, there's part of the duties of this commission is to maintain a list of volunteers, and there's gonna be volunteers that are needed to help carry out the mission of the commission. So. And I, I greatly appreciate uh, Kathleen Grabowski, your work on the ad hoc committee. Uh, my recommendation based on the application and my knowledge of the applicants are John McCracken, Kelly Grevy, Mary Wilcots, and Lucas Richardson. But ultimately this is council's appointment. That's my recommendation, thank you. Okay, um, we'll, we'll do them one at a time. Uh, I will, I would like to nominate John McCracken, 4111 Imperial Drive, Northwest Walker, Michigan, for the term ending 43024. Do I? You for support? I'm looking for support. Support, if you're looking. Yeah. Okay. So I have a motion and a second as well. I need a motion and a second. I'll make a motion. Second. Thank you. Roll call. Councilmember Bachman. Yes. 
Mayor Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Schmansky. Yes. Councilmember Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. I would like to nominate May, um, Mary K. Wilcox, 253 7th Street, for the term ending 43024. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Any discussion? Please take the roll call. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Councilmember Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Shemansky. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Bachman. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. I would like to nominate Kelly Grevy, 606 Broad Avenue, for the term ending 43025. Any Take other? motion. Second. Please take the roll call. Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Shemansky. Yes. Councilmember Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Councilmember Bachman. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. I would also like to nominate Lucas Richardson at 389 7th Street. For the term ending 43025. I need a motion. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Roll call. Councilmember Bachman. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Shemansky. Yes. Councilmember Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Tree Commission, one vacancy, term ending 12 31 24, mayoral appointment. Um, Vatter, um, I'm going to, I hope I don't mispronounce this too badly. Lerman, 445 Cedar Street. At this time, the mayor and council could take action to make appointments as noted above. Somebody want to? I'll make a motion. Second. I don't really know him. Is he here? He's not here. Okay. Okay, Heather, could you please take the roll call? Councilmember Bachman. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Shemansky. Yes. Councilmember Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Notices, communications, announcements. A report from the City of Manistee Housing Commission. A regular part of each council meeting is a report from a cooperating agency. At this time, Mr. Clinton McEvan Popus will report on the activities of the City of Manistee Housing Commission and respond to any questions the City Council, council may have regarding their activities. No action is required on this item. Welcome. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> Let me begin our little slideshow here. Slideshow, okay. What do I Press down. There we go. I want to provide an update <coughs> of where we are with the RAD conversion of Century Terrace and Harborview. <clears throat> On December 8, 2020, we signed a 9% tax credit reservation letter with MISHTA. Uh, it took until December 7th, 2021 to close on the finances of the project. And that was due to the State of Michigan Environmental and Great Lakes Energy Department on approving some things that had been approved but did not offer their signature until the late date. There we go. So construction began in Harborview on uh, January 24th. The residents were and have been relocated to a vacant unit within the Harborview apartments. 
We've engaged the services of Corrigan Moving Systems to move our residents. They pack up the residents' households. They move them into the temporary unit while the residents' unit is being rehabbed. And then they move them back to their newly rehabbed unit. And uh, I've heard lots of good reports from our residents and thanks for us having Corrigan doing their moving. Um, in fact, today I had one of our long-term residents uh, just regale me with how well um, her household was taken care of. I wanna share with you some before and after pictures um, at the Harborview Apartments. This is what a kitchen at Harborview typically looked like before the renovation. And this is the kitchen afterwards. This is uh, the living room before and in process. See some equipment in that unit. And this is the unit afterwards and near completion. What's kind of hard to tell in the picture is there's a change in the flooring. Um, and uh, it's a, um, a, like a vinyl snap together um, flooring. And you'll see in the bedroom uh, we have carpeting and brand new windows nice. um, that are there. And um, it's a perfect seal that's going around them. So we won't be having the air coming in. In fact, even without the seal being in, uh, applied to those units, those windows yet, when I was in that unit, um, the heat <laughs> was on a low setting and yet it felt very warm which is quite unusual. And then you couldn't feel wind coming through anywhere. Constantly in the past, there's always been wind coming in. And this is a picture of a bedroom uh, before the, uh, the renovation. And um, this is afterwards. This particular unit um, has a bedroom that has renovated with the same flooring as in the living room per um, reasonable accommodation request of the resident. The one um, on the far left, as I'm looking at it, um, has the carpeting uh, installed. The bathroom um, before and afterwards, um, full ADA 504 compliant uh, restroom. Century Terrace renovation coming up next. In fact, <coughs> The renovation, the uh, relocation of residents is in process, um, tail end of this week and next week. Where do we go from here? This is phase one, Century Terrace and High Review re renovation. <clears throat> These are some pictures of our family homes, the phase two RAD conversion. A little slow here. Our work isn't done. Our scattered sites, family homes, are, meet a critical need for housing within our community. They, they meet the need of those who are below 30% of area median income up to those who are below 50% of, of area median income. That's the lowest that's out there to support these families. We have three units that are in grave disre disrepair. The cost of making these three units livable is more than $160,000. There's no public housing funds to restore these units. In fact, the Detroit Field Office of Public Housing has placed those units on long-term modernization. That is, they removed them they from uh, us using them for rental units um, and still have them within the public housing guidance and ability to renovate if we find funds, which puts a time limit on us of two years. The only way for these units to continue to meet the critical housing need is RAD conversion. So phase two, the path forward. 
The commissioners are committed to keeping this housing stock for very low and extremely low income families of our community. The Housing Commission is exploring all options. I have uh, monthly conversations with um, city manager, Bill Gamble. Um, uh, Bill and uh, the mayor and I went out in January, I think it was, or was it December? I, I think it was December. Yeah, December. I know it was kind of cold out there. And we toured several of the um, uh, family units and um, looked around for um, different places we might be able to um, rebuild these units. Our goal remains to submit a 9% tax credit application for April 2023. Um, that will do, that's the round that's due for April 1, 2023. Um, so mark your calendars, everyone, to be aware that's where we're headed. Okay. Any questions I can answer for anyone? Is the Harbor Villa or Harbor View Apartments and the other one, are they, are they full? Are, they, are all the apartments rented in those? And how many are there in there? There's 48 units at Harborview, 119 units at Century Terrace. And no, they're not full right now, and that's because of the Universal Relocation Act of the federal government. Um, to be able to do this, they um, wanted us to create a plan to use our units to relocate residents. And so by natural attrition, we emptied units in both buildings so that when residents are moved, they're relocated within the building. Um, so once the renovation is done, and we're pretty close to getting done on the interior of um, Harborview, then, and we're positive we're not gonna need to move people from Century Terrace into the empties at Harborview, then we'll begin marketing and leasing up um, those empties at Harborview. Um, that is anticipated to be done for Century Terrace sometime in January or February 2023, once all the renovation um, is completed. How many units are you talking about in both of those that you're, that you're are open right now so that you can do the transitions? Uh, boy. You know, I, I can look that, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, and so I will um, get that number and email it to um, Bill and he can send it to you guys. I, I have a question for you. Uh -huh. So you have on here that you have these three units that are in grave disrepair. Mm -hmm. It's 160,000 to make them livable again. Do you have people living in them? Do. So what are we doing with them? Just letting them sit there? Yes. Okay. Water, electricity, gas, all shut off. Do you have a waiting list to get in? Yes, we do. I would imagine. And we continue to take, and I don't know the number of people on the waiting list, but would you like that? Yes. Okay. Is that the same idea with those houses on 12th and Vine Street, Clinton? You keep them empty till you get them redone? Um, <clears throat> that's what HUD had us do with the one on 10th, and we have one on Vine. Um, and then, we need to, to get uh, estimates on the units that are in uh, on 12th Street and see if they're going to be such that HUD's going to say, no, you can't put any public housing funds into them. If that's the case, then those will remain empty um, until, hand, until that time. So, and the people, if they move out, you're going to leave, just leave the homes empty? That, that would be the case, yeah. But right now, we have to determine the cost of making those units available for rental. And if it's too high and HUD says no, then they'll just sit empty. If it's not too high, then we'll use some capital funds to bring them up. Um, but it won't be up to brand new. It'll just be up to habitable. So Clinton, the, the obvious question is, you got three houses that nobody can live in and all the services are cut off. What if the city comes along and blights you? I mean, it sounds like we should. Yep. <laughs> um, we're blighting citizens. What happens next? You take them down, you can't fix them. That would be um, a phone call I'd have to make to my um, colleague at the Detroit field office to determine because they are owned by 
the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and what moves that would be taken at that point. My guess you probably should at least anticipate that coming, given the fact we have a new committee and the other stuff going on, and you just... We're keeping the outsides good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're keeping the outside in good shape. Okay. You know, and the outsides will pass HUD inspection. Okay. So you know. not quite invisible from the outside. Not at all. The grass will be cut. Weeds will be down. Trash will not be in the yards. Okay. But the insides are not habitable. Gotcha. So okay. unless the ordinance allows you to go in. No, I think you're probably okay then. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Can you uh, tell us how many of the Harborview apartments actually are fully restored and occupied now? I don't have the exact number from construction, but it's roughly 80%, 80 to 85. I know we're, we're, we're down to um, one or two stacks that are being moved from not renovated into the um, temporary units and then those being renovated. So um, I haven't gotten a report. Tomorrow we have a, a meeting every Thursday. No, tomorrow's not Thursday. Every Thursday we have a meeting to go over that. And that one is when I would have the most exact numbers. Okay. So I can get that on Thursday and stuff. And when is the final completion for uh, Harbor View? When do you anticipate all the apartments being available for reoccupancy? That would be the follow-on question. Okay. The um, quick answer on the full occupancy is that <clears throat> until we can release units from the um, universal um, relocation plan, it's um, January 1, 2023. So um, <clears throat> unless we know for sure we're not going to need any from Century Terrace, and they're just getting into Century Terrace, and construction is putting a hold on all the Harborview units just in case we have problems and need them. So <clears throat> that's a, an approved date by HUD, January 1, 2023, that would require an extension from HUD. And how many occupants currently at Century Terrace then, out of the 119? Well, that goes to how many units are empty, vice versa. Yeah, I, yeah. I have to look that up. Okay, all right. <laughs> Remind me again how many scattered homes there are? 48. 48 of the scattered homes. Okay. And three of them are the not inhabitable right now. Correct. Okay. And I should also bring attention to the um, city council that we um, own three homes through another program through MISHTA that are under permanent housing for the domestic violence um, grant um, victims. I cannot give you those addresses for obvious reasons. Um, but um, they're in neighborhoods on the north side. Um, so that we have three units that we do that. And uh, people who move into those units can stay there forever, <laughs> you know. Thank you for Thank the you. report. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Now for the most exciting part that I've been looking forward to, the introduction of the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. Council, thank you for having me tonight. Um, city staff and the city manager and myself have worked for uh, a few months now to assemble the, the proposed budget that was delivered to you. And tonight is the first of a number of um, meetings where we'll be talking about the budget. 
Typically at this first meeting, we really don't take any questions. It's more of an introduction um, to kind of go through the highlights of the budget. But I did speak with the city manager, and what we'd like to do is if you have questions, if you can get those to us in advance, it will make the work sessions that are coming up much more productive. We'll be able to get those answers, and then they can still be asked in a public forum, but it just helps, I think, the process. If we, if we have questions that you need answered, please try to get those to us uh, via email. It would be great. Can I just so, ask one question? Sure. Are you going to do all 661 pages tonight? No, I have a, okay. I have a, I have a short PowerPoint. <laughs> I have such a headache that I don't think I could sit through all of them. Okay, that was my only question. I've got some ibuprofen down in my desk. I just took two Excedrin, so I, I think I can like, keep pages. Okay. No, this is this is a, a summary of the budget. It just okay. to hit the high points. So okay. I'll try Thank to you. keep it concise and keep it moving along. So quickly, just kind of, um, and, and but this is in the general order of, pages that you'll see in the budget okay. so that's just to keep in mind um, budget highlights again the general fund is balanced but we are in the year three of the hundred thousand dollar fund reserve contributions to the motor pool so that's been working out well we had our largest taxable value increase in quite some time of 5.4 percent but unfortunately we also had a headley rollback and that's going to reduce our millage rate by almost a little over a quarter of a mil um, headley rollbacks it's a complex formula but it's basically due to robust property sales market and uncappings is what leads to a head loop. That's the second year in a row that we've had one and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, budget, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, proposes a three and a half percent water and sewer rate increase, which is the rate increase that's been recommended by the rate consultants. Uh, recommends a 4.3% refuse rate increase to keep up with the contractual costs. Um, it's also gonna propose a half mil refuse increase for the PFAS remediation, which we'll talk about. And we fund almost $10 million of capital improvements and staff, uh, and that I mean everybody who works on these projects is, is pretty much at capacity. We've been doing an awful lot of capital projects and it should start to wind down, but there, there's just a lot on the plate. And you see that in one of the pages of the budget. Um, we have special issue pages in the budget. I'm not going to talk about these, but they're just identified here. That's a place where you can go to get more detailed information on some of these major topics. This is uh, what we do in the budget every year, and I think it's very helpful for the public council. So we talk about ARPA funding, we talk about blight, uh, we talk about parks and riverwalk maintenance. Um, we talk, there's a page about riverwalk improvements. And then the PFAS issue, which I mentioned, uh, is discussed fairly extensively in one of those pages and then kind of a repeat from last year the fire aerial lift and pumper what's changed there is we have submitted a grant to FEMA to help fund that so um, if that happens then that plan will change but it just kind of reiterated the plan that was laid out last year overall overall in the city the budget's about 23 million dollars it's down about 3 million from last year that's primarily a reduction in capital projects due to the timing of uh, bond projects and and the different things we're doing with the wet weather corrective action program. Um, those charts, and these are in the, in the budget as well, just kind of give you the general breakdown of uh, where, the, where the budget is uh, comprised of. Uh, general fund is the biggest. Um, well, actually, in this case, it's the second biggest because the sewer fund has a lot of capital projects. Um, and then it goes from there. And then on the type of expense, obviously, our operating expense is about two-thirds uh, of the overall budget. And then the capital outlay and debt service make up the remainder. Key points for the general fund, the total budget is about $7.3 million, which is a considerable increase over uh, last year. That's due to ARPA funding primarily, but also uh, growth in the tax base. We'll get into more details on that. As I mentioned, it vests the 100000 to stabilize the motor pool. Um, our full-time staffing is stable, and it does fund two more seasonal employees for the Parks Department to kind of respond to some of the community concerns on maintenance issues. Uh, it's not proposing any service reductions, and we recognize all of the ARPA revenue in this budget, and then we actually use some of the ARPA revenue, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more. It also increases Parks, DDA, and Riverwalk maintenance. Overall, revenue is up about 6.5%, and again, a lot of that's due to the ARPA revenue. Um, our taxes are up. That includes the uh, payment in lieu of taxes, because some of the pilots that you've approved uh, over the past couple of years are starting to kick in. Um, state and federal revenue is up. That's where the grant revenue is. Those are the primary drivers of the, of the general fund revenue. I think this chart's really important, the taxable and assessed value. 
This year is the first year that both our taxable value and our assessed value exceeded their previous highs in 2008. So if you think about that, that's almost 15 years to get back to where we were in 2008. And that's because of the way the Michigan uh, law um, limits the growth of taxable value in communities. And MML has referred to this as the broken municipal finance system. There's lots of articles about that. But there's some communities that had such a steep decline in 2008 that they may never get back to that place just because of the way the laws are structured. We didn't have a steep of a hit, and we've really popped back up in the last few years. But as I mentioned, because of that and because of the robust property sales, we've uh, lost some of our operating millage due to Headley rollback. So over two years, um, we've lost over a half a mill, which is about 2.9% of our tax taxable revenue. So it's about $106,000 cumulatively. Uh, and that remains until you uh, have a Headley rollback election if that ever happens. So we're, uh, we're up against our Headley max, so we, can't, we don't have the luxury of raising that millage at all. It's a significant issue for us. Uh, general fund revenue, um, we're talking about state revenue sharing here. You can see we had almost a million dollars way back in 2001. And uh, after that recession, the tech bubble, um, the state government cut, 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 cut our revenue sharing, and they've never restored it. It has obviously started to come back up since about 2011, but it's still considerably lower than what it was back in 2001. The chart on the right just shows that cumulative loss. It's over $6.3 million in funding remained where it was in 2000. Let's talk ARPA revenue. This is kind of a complex topic, but we have a really good plan um, to, to implement this that will give the city a whole lot of flexibility. And it's really courtesy of all the public comments that came into Treasury and when they issued their final rule. Um, they had a pretty narrow scope of things that you could spend this money on originally, but when they issued the final rule, they did a few things. And we've talked about this, but I just kind of want to go into it a little bit. The primary thing is that any community that receives less than $10 million, they can deem that to be revenue replacement. And so what that allows you to do is use that towards any government service that your government traditionally performs. So that could be wages, it could be capital projects, it could be supplies, it could be utilities, it can be anything. And what the, the final rule allows you to do is basically apply that money, and we're getting in two different years about $643,000, but basically apply that towards some of your normal operating expenses. And that's called supplanting those funds. And then once those, once you spend those, or expend those ARPA revenue that way, and you're really not expending it, it's just uh, an accounting measure, then those funds become unrestricted. So what we're suggesting that we do, it would be one, is to pass a resolution applying those ARPA funds to our normal wage expenses for 22 and 23. That will then make those funds unrestricted. Um, and then we would restrict those funds internally to be able to use them on projects that council deems. And we have a list of recommendations, but it gives us um, even more flexibility than what's the timing that's in the ARPA thing. The budget itself um, has identified about $140,000 of ARPA funds to be used, and then about 40,000 in the future. So that'd leave about 463,000 for other, other items. The recommendations that are laid out in the budget are for funding a housing coordinator position at Housing North for three years, $20,000 a year. So only 20,000 of that is recognized in this budget. $20,000 for a one-year commitment to help enhance the economic development contract with the Chamber of Commerce. $20,000 for an automated beach hazard warning system to replace the flag system that we have down there. It's kind of cutting edge technology and Chief Glass has been very involved in that. Um, some money to fund two new city entrance signs on 31 on the north and south sides. One of those signs is um, in disrepair and actually they had to take it down. Um, it's long overdue to have those. And then also if there's money to maybe uh, update or enhance some of the existing wayfinding signage. And then uh, 20000 for the amphitheater study, um, plus there's some local funding from the Salt City Group, uh, and that's been kind of languishing because we haven't had funding for it. So all, all in all, that's about 180000 It's not, again, all in this next budget because one of them is a three-year commitment. But other projects that the staff kind of vetted um, and put on a short list for council to consider would be possibly doing some upgrades on 6th Street when the, when the school does that project there. Um, 
a grant match for the North Riverwalk upgrade, which is going to be pretty critical. A grant match for potential beach master plan. Um, possibly doing a study for the waterworks building, which is going to be vacated by the end of this year. Uh, possibly putting some money towards city wireless network infrastructure upgrades and replacements, although we did slot a lot of money in the budget for that this year. We may not need that. Uh, possible grant match for some of the projects that come out of the current Ramsdale Theater Master Plan project, which is about a quarter of the way through. Um, establishing a city housing fund, which is something that the city manager has been talking about. Um, uh, possibly doing a grant match if we get the FEMA grant for the aerial lift and then having some contingency money on the fire station renovation because we're all very nervous that those bids are going to come back way higher just because of all the inflation. So those are some options. There's more. And leave that up a minute. Sure. On that amphitheater, uh, the city is putting in money. I thought that the group is going to supply all that to get a feasibility study. So we had, a, we had taken or gotten a proposals that's been a few years now and I think it was around 30,000 to do that so the Salt City group will have some money and then whatever they can't raise if we want to get that study started we're proposing to use some ARPA money to supplement that so it just depends on how much is available and what the what the study is those might that might have to be rebid or re because those proposals are kind of stale it's been a few years on that um, if that's something that council wants to spend it on that's up to them that's their prerogative but we did include it in the budget uh, general fund revenue, marijuana tax. You've probably seen the headlines. Um, we get a portion of the state excise tax on retail sales, and it's distributed based on all the excise taxes they receive. Basically, there's a formula, but then it's divided by the number of uh, retail establishments in the state. So back in 21, we only had one license, and each license got about 28,000. We bu had budgeted, assuming we were going to have five licenses for fiscal year 22 and a hundred thousand dollars thinking that maybe that money might go down a little bit because there's really no way to model this we just don't have any data to do it and it turns out there was a whole lot more cannabis sales than people expected so each license was almost uh, over fifty thousand dollars per license so that information came out after we had prepared the budget um, we prepared the budget very conservatively we budgeted eighty thousand that's based partially on some information. I don't know if you read Bridge Magazine, but uh, the price of retail cannabis has plummeted because there's <coughs> oversupply. So as those prices go down, you, the, the excise tax raises less money, even though sales may be going up. And then as you have more retail establishments, the pie gets sliced up. So we don't have a good way to model that, but we did get quite a bonus uh, this year with almost $283,000. And as I say, future revenues are pretty uncertain due to a variety of factors. Won't we uh, be garnering some additional revenues from the grow facilities once they uh, start operating? We'll get some additional license revenue, yes. Yeah. Um, it's $5,000 per license. And isn't there, doesn't the grow facility revenues also count against the tax? On the excise tax, I don't know, but I can get back to you with an answer on that. Yep. Um, general fund expenses, those are up about 449000 or 6.5%. You can see how that's broken down. Um, you know, DPW and parks are about $2 million. Police is about one5 Fires Fire is about one3 uh, All administrative uh, departments are about 15%, etc. cetera. And again, um, we have a lot of capital projects, um, so our our overall our wages are about 42 percent but if you look at like just the general fund they're closer to uh, 60 not wages wages and fringes are closer to 60 percent just on a highlight on some of the general fund expenses things that are kind of different from last year or changed um, there is some money in the council budget to possibly get a facilitator to do a strategic plan update it's been a number of years since that's been done and we've tried a variety of different ways to do it, but we did want to slot some money in case council wanted to hire a professional facilitator. Um, we have money in to write the master plan. It's due. It's been over five years. Um, police accreditation is still being funded. As I mentioned, we increased the park's seasonal employees by two to help uh, with the maintenance. Uh, the Parks Beach Amphitheater study, which we mentioned, we have $15,000 in, kind of as a one-time bump for contractual landscape maintenance to kind of catch up on some of the pruning and uh, maybe some uh, other landscaping things that we haven't been able to get to. There's some money to upgrade some of the parks benches and also the DDA clock repairs, which has been not working for a while. 
Uh, we talked about the, the two appropriations. The motor pool contributions are continuing to be increased per the plan. Um, the the $100,000 for three years contributions doesn't work unless we continue to also increase those contributions at an inflationary rate, so it does fund that. However, the high inflation that everybody is hearing about and experiencing is going to impact our fuel prices potentially significantly, especially if we have a hard winter and also just supply costs. So we have factored some of that in. Um, whether it's enough or not is to be determined. And we did get some really good news on the health insurance. Originally, we had thought that we were going to come in at 12 percent, which had been the highest we would have had probably in five years. But it actually came in flat. We just got those quotes back earlier this week. So that's really good news for both the city and for the employees. So that, that actually does free up a little bit of money in the budget. I don't have that calculated, but it's, it's obviously not 12%, which is uh, good news for us. And I have one question sure. on the Chamber of Commerce increase. Um, is it budgeted for, isn't it budgeted 40,000 to the Chamber? And then is this another 20,000 on top of it? Yes. Downtown Development Authority, uh, that budget's included in the city budget as we've done now for I think the last couple of years. Um, I worked with Christina very closely. Uh, she was great to work with. Um, we tried to simplify it a little bit so it wasn't as kind of overwhelming as it's been in the past. Um, the main things, and, and she can talk about this, or a DDA representative can talk about this more fully, but basically it does invest some fund balance for streetscape design. Um, for their contribution to the Riverwalk Plaza out in front of the West Shore Community College building and then to hire a, some kind of a contractual event coordinator. I don't know the details of that, but she would be able to talk through that. And as you know, they're considering a bond for a future streetscape, but they've got to do a work before they get to that point. Uh, the chart on the right, just for your information, it's always good to remember is that about 64% of the tax capture that the DDA gets comes from the city operating and city refuse millages. The rest of it comes from the county and non-city entities. Okay, quickly, water and sewer. Water is about $3 million or 12% of the budget, and sewer budget because of the capital projects is about 33%. Um, we are proposing a 3.5% rate increase. Again, that's the standard. And it's important to know that that 3.5% inflationary increase has uh, allowed us to do lots of things um, in the water and sewer budgets. Primarily, besides just operating the stuff, well, we were able to do day-to-day -day maintenance, but we're also starting to be able to invest in projects that we can marry up with street projects. Uh, we are going to be doing a rate study. Uh, like I just got an email to kind of kick that back off again now that the DWAM um, study is further along and we will have that incorporated in the next year's budget to make sure we're still on track. Key points on the water and sewer, um, we're gonna complete the wet weather corrective action program. Um, when is that gonna be completed? Probably August, September. Um, obviously, they've gotta commission the new plant and I think uh, Mr. McCoola and uh, uh, Mr. Moore would like to rename that the Clean Water Recovery Facility, is that still the plan, Jeff, rather than the Wastewater Treatment Plant. That's kind of where the industry is going. Uh, they're going to have ongoing lead and copper monitoring and, and any remediation that might be needed. Um, again, complete this rate sufficiency analysis that we talked about, complete the DWAM grant, and then there's various other capital projects. Uh, Marina, um, Marina's doing a little better. Um, they, we seem to have a lot more fuel sales last year. The dockage is good. I think the response to our new docks was great. But weather or revenue to the marina is very dependent on three factors, weather, fishing, and fuel. And we don't control any of those, unfortunately. All we can do is have a really nice facility and good customer service. So um, we did recommend reducing support from the capital improvement fund this year by 5,000, which is the first time we've done that in a while. Again, that goes to pay their debt service that they couldn't otherwise fund. So that's uh, trending in the right direction. There's a, the patio improvement project should be ex completed by summer. Um, and Mr. McCoola just hired a new assistant to, uh, to re not replace Kathy, but to fill Kathy's job. And she's an experienced marina manager. She's managed marina for over a decade and will be doing a lot of hands-on with the marina because Laura, the previous marina manager, um, so that should be really, uh, I think, good for our marina, and um, hopefully we can 
get it so that this is being recognized for as nice a facility as it is. And I think having Fricano's opening up um, will help as well, having a restaurant right there. And obviously, if you've seen the big crane, we're replacing the old docks right now, the, the five or six that weren't done previously. Boat launch, uh, that's very self-sustaining. Again, it's vulnerable to downturn and fishing conditions and also fuel prices and weather, same thing as the marina. We did pay off the loan for the Arthur Street renovation uh, this fiscal year. So that'll allow us to save some more dollars and eventually we're gonna have to replace that first street auto attendant. But um, so far, it's, we've been able to keep it going with just replacement parts, but it's getting towards the end of its useful life and the technology is pretty outdated. Um, and then also we, want, we need to be able to accumulate reserves in that fund to leverage uh, future grants to either improve Knight Street Boat Launch and or you know, help to contribute to repaving that big parking lot at some point. Oil and Gas Fund, um, that's been doing very well. One thing that has changed is as tech producing companies sold all of their assets and wells, they had more than were just in Manistee, but they sold those to Hound Resources which is a company over on the northeast side of the state. And we, we've talked with them and uh, they seem to be a pretty quality organization. You know, time will tell, but uh, that, that should bode well because I think they're gonna invest back in those wells and try to increase their productivity. Our accumulated royalties are about 7.6 million. That's, the, what's that's what's protected principal by the charter. But the value of the portfolio as of the end of the fiscal year was about 13.6. Now, since that time, it's gone down with the downturn in the stock market, but that's where it was the last time uh, we kind of looked at it. <coughs> I, have a, I have a comment about Aztec. Sure. It's selling to how resources. That is the well across the street from the senior center, right? That's There's one. actually four or five wells. That I one, saw it running, that's why. I yeah, that one pad has wells that go off in all different directions, and then there's one over by the city garage just on the other side of Veterans Oak Grove. Okay, yep. I'm glad it's producing. Um, the 3.5% spending rule is gonna generate about 422,000 this year, which is the highest it's ever done, even though the percentage was lowered by 0.25%. And our compounded annual return since March of 2009 is a remarkable 9.8%. So you've got a 14 year run of almost 10% compounded rate of return, which is pretty remarkable for a fund like this. Um, just some graphs, these are all in the chart showing you know, what the accumulated principal and accumulated earnings are, uh, what, what the earnings have been over time. They're variable, um, but we haven't been negative, which is good, uh, that's why we accumulate those excess earnings is to be able to offset any time that we have downturns. Um, streets, uh, there's a pretty comprehensive section in the budget about streets. Um, some of these charts you've seen in the State of the Streets report that they do in January. But you can see over the last five years, um, you know, the overall condition of good streets has kind of actually gone down, the, but the fair streets have gone up by about the same amount. Uh, not quite as much and the poor streets have gone up a little bit. And that's kind of reversed a trend that we've had for a few years before that and the reason for that, and it may be time again possibly to, to come back and have some more asset management training because there's a lot of new people on council that did go through that the first time, but is we've been focusing a lot of our money on reconstruction with utilities underneath because of a whole bunch of different dynamics that fit into that transportation improvement plan. And um, by the nature of that, you're gonna lose ground because you can only do not very long sections of pavement and meanwhile, all the rest of the pavement's getting another year of aging on it. So one of the things that we did a few years back was you know, a whole bunch of slurry ceiling. I think we did five or six miles and that really bumped up the condition. But that's what asset management principles would have you do is to focus on keeping those moderate to good streets good for the longest time possible and then funding reconstruction as you can. And because of circumstances, projects, uh, critical needs, detours, we've had to do more reconstruction recently, but we really do need to get back to the asset management. Problem is we still don't have enough money to do both. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next few slides. This chart is in the budget, just shows the total investment, um, total project, and then the, the local street and the major street investments. Um, so for the entire uh, tip, there's about, $4 million worth of total projects for streets with related utilities. This is a map that shows the proposed work. Uh, as you can see, Mayor Quincy Street's on there, which is your 
favorite project um, that's going to come along. Hopefully we can still get that done if we can get the materials in. But we've got some other projects that are slated on there. And again, this is all in the budget. Um, so this is what I wanted to talk about. And it, this is really more setting the table for the next year or two to have a discussion and a conversation with council and the community. Um, the city has spent a significant amount of money over the past five to seven years on streets. We've used resources from Capital Improvement Fund, we've, we've used general fund resources, and we've leveraged grants, and we've gotten a lot more money from the state since they adjusted the gas tax. So we have, we have significantly invested and prioritized in streets. But even with that, since 2008, the chart on the right there is the average PACER rating. We haven't moved the needle much. Needle just hasn't, it just hasn't gone up. And you can see, if you look at uh, the section from 2010 to 2000. 11, 12, that was a result that went up quite a bit. Well, that was a result of a sewer separation project, Cedar Street. We did miles of streets, plus we led a bond to do some of the orphan streets, and that's, that went up. But then it drops off because we can't sustain that level of investment. And then again, you see it went up pretty significantly in 2016, 2017. I believe that's when we did the six miles of slurry seal. But then we started doing reconstruction, and it drops off again. We simply can't make a noticeable dent in this condition of streets with the funding, even though it's greatly increased from where we're at. Um, so one of the things that we need to keep in mind, we've pretty much implemented every recommendation of the Ad Hoc Street Committee, except the last two. And I have this on here as two options for future consideration. One would be to do a Headley override vote, or propose a Headley override vote to the public, and then earmark those dollars for street work. or do a voted bond issue where it's a separate millage and bundle up a bunch of projects and, and try to do those roads. Uh, but you also have to have money for the utilities underneath, so you've got to pick those projects carefully. But this graph really tells the tale. We can keep doing what we're doing, but we're not going to make a dent in that without something changing. And that was identified in the Street Ad Hoc Committee report is that you just need more resources. Inflation is not helping either. Things are going up dramatically with costs. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, moving on to the refuse fund. Um, we have a contract with Republic Services that has an annual inflationary adjustment. So we typically have not adjusted the millage, haven't done that in years, and we just do annual rate increases. Um, our fund reserves, based, you can see that on the chart, were previously more than we needed, so we drew those down over time and kind of limited rate increases. We got down to a point where we couldn't continue to do that, so we've had to start raising rate increases the last five or six years. But the big unknown here is the PFAS contamination that's been identified by Eagle at the old city landfill site. Um, until we get better data, we don't really know what the long-term costs of that are gonna be, but we know we have to do some investigations with either boring wells or sampling, and that could be rather expensive. We might have some options to lower that cost, but the only reasonable way to raise that amount of money, you'd either have to raise the rates or you've got just the millage. And unfortunately, we do have room to raise the millage if need be to address that. Um, but we are the responsible party. The city is liable, and the city is going to be forced to address it by the state. So we propose a half mil increase that can be adjusted in future years as needed, but we just don't know the cost yet. Problem is we only have one time a year to be able to adjust that millage, and that's just part of the budget adoption process. So that half, mil, that half a mil would appear on our property taxes? Yes. Okay. Just like it does now. Right now it's one. <coughs> that's what we're proposing. Yep, it's one. But I, I'll... I'll show you on a different slide. There's, it's actually, if that was something that council wanted to do, it's not a bad time to do it, and I'll, you'll see why in a minute here. So I jumped it a little bit, but, but basically that would generate about 100,000, which is in conversations with the environmental consultants, that would probably, that with maybe a little bit of the fund balance would get us to a point where we could appease the eagle and, until we get a better plan. Um, but in 2021, our millage was 18.9. That's the combination of our refuse millage and our operating millage. Because of the two Headley rollbacks, which I think I showed you on a previous slide was about 0.52, even if we raised the millage up by 0.5, we'd still be less than what we were in 2021. Um, just something to think about. Okay. 
Motor pool, uh, quickly, we've got a number of pieces of equipment identified. They're all recommended to be cash purchases, except for a plow truck. Three of those purchases were budgeted for this year, but because of supply chain disruptions have been delayed, so we won't spend the money in the current fiscal year. We're just sliding it to the next fiscal year. Two of those were because of a failure of a piece of equipment, and Jeff slid those to buy the other one. So it's just kind of moving the chess pieces around. That was uh, Matt, the Motor Pool Committee. Matt discussed that, and um, that's based on the very detailed schedule that we keep for the Motor Pool. Capital Improvement Fund, uh, we talked about that a little bit. Um, I think it's always good to keep in mind what the commitments of this are. And again, this is where this gets money from the Oil and Gas Fund via the spending rule that for 3.5% uh, we talked about. But we, we have prior commitments of 243,000. We have an allocation to local streets of 80,000. And then the current projects are budgeted at 226. And the proposed spending by category, that chart's also in the budget, but we've got uh, buildings, marina, parks, equipment, and streets. It's kind of a, a widespread of projects that we're doing there, uh, as you can see from that pie chart. Quickly, uh, some of the projects here. Um, we've got commitments to, for the Ramsell HVAC debt, the marina support, and a payment for the 2020 capital improvement bond. Um, and then new projects are listed here, including support for local streets. Um, the Morton Park improvements are a carryover because those won't get done this fiscal year, but will stretch into the next. Uh, city garage restroom improvements. Um, actually, that didn't get done in 2021 because of the pandemic and um, inadvertently got left off, did not carry over. So what that project was never done. Um, that's also some hallway uh, flooring. So that, that got carried over into this year. Uh, the downtown fountain is slated here to be looked at and repaired. Uh, Ramsdell Theater pillar repairs, which are in disrepair, is a carryover because we're waiting to finish that study to see what needs to happen to them. There's some marine electrical repair, which is discussed in the budget, uh, scheduled file server replacement. Police patrol rifles um, that we couldn't fit into the general fund, although with all the marijuana money, we probably could now if we wanted to invest fund balance there. Uh, some money for the wireless network infrastructure and some money to put bulletproof glass both in the police department and up on the city hall level. So that's all talked about in the budget. And finally, just kind of the path forward, and I thought I'd show a picture of the, of the river walk, our newest path, which is beautiful and probably getting lots of use, but Today we're introducing the budget. Uh, we'll have a budget discussion next week. Um, the week after that, there's a budget public hearing and then a budget discussion after that. Uh, we have an optional budget discussion on the 26th. In the past, sometimes we've needed that, sometimes we haven't. It just depends on uh, how the process goes. And then budget adoption is slated for May 3rd. So that's all I have. Um, Bill, did you have any comments? I just want to thank Ed and department heads for all their work on the budget, and we're looking forward to working with council to bring this to adoption. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate it, too. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. Um, it's time again for concerns and comments from citizens. This is an opportunity for citizens to comment on municipal services, activities, or areas of the city involvement. Citizens in attendance shall be recognized by the mayor for comments limited to five minutes. Letters submitted to council will now be publicly read. Please come forward. Please. Please I state your name again. Yeah, my name is Ruth Pratt. I live at 463 Forest Street. And I just wanted to bring something to sight that happened to us after that torrential rain we had not long ago. I said to my husband, you know, why don't you go down the basement and make sure we don't have any water in there? We never get water in our basement, but that was a lot of rain real quick. And he said, well, we don't have water in the basement from the walls, but we've got water coming up from the drain. So I'm like, well, you mean like sewer water? Well, I don't know, it mu must be, he said. So I called the sewer people, and they said, call the city. So I got online, this is a Sunday, and the number that's there to call in an emergency is Central Dispatch. So when he says 911, I'm thinking, well, I didn't dial 911. Why am I getting 911? So I explained to him, he said, okay, I'll get a hold of somebody. So this is Sunday. We went until the next Saturday 
with no water. Seven days. Let me tell you what it's like to have to use the restroom at 10.30 at night, get dressed, have to go to one of my kids and bother them to use the restroom. My husband has COPD. Every four hours during all that time, we had to turn that pump on so our basement wouldn't be flooded with sewer water and crap. The city came and said it was not them. So then the sewer people came on that Sunday. They were there for five hours. They said, we're all the way out to the city, and I'm telling you, it's the city. Oh, well, you know, what do you do? The city says it's not. The, sewer, the, the other people say it, it isn't us. So get a hold of the city again, and they say, well, they come out. I make a long story short, they were there four times insisting that it wasn't them. We went from Sunday until Friday. Friday, everybody left. The person that the city suggested we call because they have a camera, which the people we called did not have a camera. Um, in five minutes, the camera guy said, it's not you. So all that time, they leave on Friday and said, well, it's the weekend, we'll be back on Monday. I don't mean it wrong. By that time, I'm crying. I mean, to not be able to use the restroom, to not be able to run any water, not be able to do any dishes, which means you're not cooking. You're either eating out or getting fast food. For my husband, who has COPD, to be down there 24 hours a day, every four hours, turning on a pump. And, run, and we're running it down our driveway, just so everybody knows, which I think is appalling, but what else were we to do? And that's what we were told to do with it. So to make a long story short, I say to the guy who has the camera, does the city not have a camera? How expensive are they? He says, there's $7,500 for the one I have, but Ruth, I'm going to get one that costs $15,000. I don't mean it wrong. If somebody would have put the camera down that city thing on the first day, we wouldn't have went for eight days. I am appalled at the back and forth that it went, and if my son wouldn't have sent every one of you council members a note, an email on Friday, we would have went until that Monday. But let me tell you, Cindy Lundberg called me and she said, I'm calling Jeff McCoola. Somebody will be there tomorrow morning. We put the dogs out first thing in the morning, and let me tell you, the person we had called with the camera was there and the city was there an hour and the guy who with a camera came back and said you're clear I had to go home and make a tool because it was a bunch of baby wipes and Lysol wipes that were caught up in the in the sewer thing and he said you know they undo the manhole and say well water's flowing and he said I'm sorry this happened to you well I'm sorry too and I think it's a shame that it happens to anybody ever again let me tell you, I was at a near, I've never been so unable to handle things in my life. I'm kind of like a clean freak. And you know when you got COVID and, and your husband's having to put a hose in the sewer thing and you don't have any water to wash your hands and you're going out and using gallons of water to wash out in the yard? That is just, I think it's beyond despicable. And I should not have had to wait that long. And we're getting all this pot money. Maybe somebody can can pay for a $15,000 camera. Mrs. Pratt, you have five seconds. Well, that's what I've got to say. I, it happened to me, I'm, I, I'm disgusted. It shouldn't ever happen to anybody else again. Thank you. Anybody else? Name and address? <laughs> My name is Libby Zilke, and I'm at 706 Hopkins Street here in Manistee. I just want to thank you all for um, these few moments after a very lengthy meeting. I'm Libby Zilke, and that's my sister Mickey, and we are th from Three Peas in a Pod, located in the back of War Hardware, which previously housed the hitching post on 31. Mr. War has made it possible for us 
um, for many ways to be located there and has helped us open a store that was only previously a dream for all of us. We've been open since August of 2021. This really is a challenging location to have um, area visitors see our signs on a four lane spot near a stoplight. We were granted a permit to hang a sign on the building, but folk, folks can't see it until they are almost even with the building. We invested in a big feather sign. It is, is higher than the ceiling right here. Um, but um, uh, and we put that out after the holidays, which brought us noticeably more foot traffic to our establishment. But recently we've been told we cannot display said flag. No one could tell us if we could put a smaller one out there. Our concern is next year when the traffic is possibly detoured in that area, we are really going to have a huge challenge notifying the public of our existence. So I'm here this evening just to ask the council for some guidance on signage in a challenging place to have a store. Um, has there ever been exceptions to rules that are in place regarding signage? I don't know, but I just want to tell you, I appreciate any support that you can give us. Um, and I want to tell you thanks for your time and thanks for all you do. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that would like to come forward? Seeing none, I'll move on to officials and staff. Mr. Gamble. Uh, just an update on Maple Street Bridge. So the west sidewalk it's going to be open to pedestrians just for a little bit, just about a week. And then it's going to have to close again for the ceiling and some other punch list items till the end of the month. <clears throat> but we're, uh, we're hoping it would open up earlier, but all the there's still some work that needed to be done. So just up to on that. Thank you. It's, no, it's always nice to see you, Mr. Wilson. It's always my pleasure to be here, Madam Mayor. And I have nothing more for the council other than my thanks for allowing me to attend tonight's meeting. Well, good. I hope you enjoyed it. I do. Heather. Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, city Engineer. Just a couple small things. The um, 12th Street project that's over by the school is going off for a bit, so that we're hopefully we'll getting those bits soon. And then the uh, drinking water asset management uh, grant, we put those, that was open, bids were open today, and they're favorable. We're working with the contractor now. And that will be to locate all the sewer water services to start determining uh, material types for evil. Chief Cameron. Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. McCoola. Nothing, Your Honor. Chief Glass. I don't have anything, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Bachman. <clears throat> I'd like to thank Mrs. Pratt for her comment tonight. I apologize because the situation you had, and I agreed that it was completely unacceptable, and we probably should be getting a camera. Thank you. Well, I do appreciate that Cindy Lumber called and asked if she could bring us water. I mean, I, I felt bad to think that my son had to send everybody a thing before I got any action, because we've lived here for 30 years, never had anything like this happen. And, you know, with each day, it just seemed like, Tomorrow it's going to be over. We, we, should, we should be better at that. It wasn't. We should be better at that. Thank you. Ms. Lundberg. Um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate seeing you face to face now. Um, and I appreciate you voicing that. And I agree that we, we need to be better at that. And I'm sorry that you had to go through with that. And um, I was wondering, Ed, is it possible to get your slideshow sent to us? I think that was a really great overview and a nice piece to kind of some stuff together so if that's possible I would love to have that. Thank you. Nothing. Mr. Kowalski. Uh yeah. I'm sorry for your that you had all that trouble with that sewer. That's terrible. Def, can we afford a camera to so we can use it in these situations? Because she shouldn't have to nobody should have to go through that. Got $286,000 Yeah, we've researched those and had demos in the past and didn't feel that the quality um, of the camera 
we had a lot of bad demonstrations with them. And so uh, we felt that having a local contractor in town for the one or two times a year that we needed it would be uh, easier to just call Sam and, Sam and Sewer and, and use theirs when necessary. Did they, you said they got a camera? Yeah. What happened with this situation? Why didn't they call it? So it's a very, <laughs> there's a lot, lot more information. Um, I wasn't a part of it until I got everybody's emails that Friday night, but uh, my understanding is that uh, that the homeowners hired a contractor and the contractor did some work, got to a point, and said, well, it's, I think it's the city's issue. Um, the city was contacted, uh, we sent crews out, and this is a fairly unique main because it flows not down a street, it flows behind the houses. Um, and so the crews verified that the sewer was flowing. Um, we didn't have any other reports of other backups. Um, I believe they hired a different contractor who then did some more work, um, stayed in, contract, in contact with uh, Brandon Prince through the week, and each time progressed, found issues, progressed, found issues, and my understanding was that they had restored the flow on Friday, um, Friday of that week. And then Andy was checking to see if he could uh, return again that Saturday morning um, to assist us with doing some additional work accessing from the city's main. So um, when we got the emails or when all of you got the emails and individually started forwarding them to me, we were waiting for the contractor to get out of his daughter's play before we could schedule that and confirm it. So once he called and said, yep, I got my guys ready and we'll be out there, then um, the group worked on it Saturday morning, so. Thank you. Nope. One more thing, Jeff. I, guess. Um, I know we got this park situation coming up that we want to talk about the parks and all that. What are we doing with Mac Park? I see a tree fell down, crushed the fence. Uh, that's been going down in bad shape lately. Mac Park? I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, the tree is in, down in the back. All the limbs are breaking your whole fence down. Oh. The, the fence, the gates on the fences, I've set them up myself for the last two years. There's no fence in them anymore. It's just the piping. Uh, you know, it's just really in bad shape down there. Well, certainly. Let Mickey know him tomorrow morning to go up and look at it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Are you finished? Okay. 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 Chief Glass, um, I know we got our new committee going. Uh, back to the people. What I like to know is, uh, are the guys? Did they see the car sitting in the driveway up third in Hancock? It's on third. Off. You can when you go down Hancock North. You look right at this car and there's no plates on it. Looks like there's no tires on it. I don't specifically know that. I can look up in our system and see what they're doing with it. Yeah, I've looked at your report and I didn't see anything in there. Uh, I know there's a house at 5th and Ramsdale too that's got all kinds of junk by it. And then the old bakery on 1st Street. Mm -hmm. That was a furniture store. See the whole side of it, if you're going west on 1st Street, the whole thing is... We've like talked about it already. been addressed by Sergeant Van Sickle. So as we published in the paper, our blight enforcement really is going to ramp up this week. We've given the community at least a month's notice and given them alternative resources. Right. So when the snow is melted as it is now, they know in a month we'll be out there. That month is now. <coughs> I, I don't have answers for a specific. I know that the First Street Bakery is being addressed by Sergeant Van Sickle. Okay. He's in close contact with that owner there. As far as the cars, I don't know. I can, I can get an answer for you and, and circle back with that. Okay. Thank you. I can tell you that the health on 8th Street uh, is being recited after yep. over two decades. It's being recited. It's underway right now. So and the neighbor told me to tell us, Kirsten, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Well, one more thing. Now that we've elected the people on the restoration committee, I'd like to bring up about, I think that we should have more than four citizens on this thing, because uh, one is a council person. I think we need to put more people on this thing. Uh, I know we voted in the, the five people, but I talked to the mayor and he agrees we, we should have more people on this. I think 
more minds are better than just a few. So I appreciate that we bring this back to a vote to put more people on. Now are you finished? Are you finished? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Schmansky. Uh, just, just one is a public service announcement. Uh, uh, we have an ordinance that requires the large garbage cans to be enclosed. Uh, people were given two years to come up with the proper fencing and there's, there's lots of different ways that they can be enclosed. Uh, but we're running out of time. I believe it expires in May and I, and I know there's a number of, of different of these large trash cans and, and it's, a public, it's a public health issue partially because animals can get into these bins and these garbage, plus certainly unsightly, and it kind of fits in with the whole idea of blight. So just a, a heads up for people that May is right around the corner, just with spring too. And then the other thing is, I didn't see anything specifically in the budget on our sidewalks. And I was just hoping that uh, uh, we would have a plan to address um, our sidewalk uh, process. So there is money um, in, the, in the budget for sidewalks. It flows from the city street fund of the major and local streets both. We can talk about that more at the, at the upcoming work. Okay, great. Thank you. Mrs. Is Pratt, I'm, I'm very sorry that this has happened to you. I, I spent a, a quite a bit of time talking to your son between Friday night and Saturday to make sure things were okay. I know you did, and, and I it, appreciated it, that. And, and you know, if I would have thought earlier in the week, I would have contacted somebody, but I had full faith that yep. my water department was taking care of us, you know? I just, I just thought, well, when they say it's not them, they must know it's not them. Right. And then the people we hired that come say, well, you're, you're clear to the sewer line, so it's not us, it's got to be somebody. I mean, that it's taken care of. But, like I said, I just think this a water department our size, at, if the price for a good camera is $15,000, you need one. Thank you. Um, I just also wanted to talk about the um, Neighborhood uh, Restoration Beautification Committee. It was hard making this decision, uh, I'm sure. Um, I think one of the factors that were considered with this first round of applicants was what else do they bring to the table? What is their network? What, can, what other skills and services can they provide? Because it was important for us to have a nucleus of people that could do that. Lucas Richardson works for Spicer. He's a civil engineer. Um, he's worked on all the streets. He kind of knows his way around. Kelly Grevy has been an outstanding volunteer citizen and was able to amass 159 volunteers who worked on the Riverwalk this past summer, so she's got a network. Mary Kay Wilcox is a uh, lender at uh, West Shore Bank. She's been in the business for many, many years in banking. She and her husband have also invested in the community, and they have, um, they have bought dilapidated properties and fixed them up and sold them, and they know this process back and forth. And she knows all the, all the different lending tools that could be available. Mr. McCracken, some of you, some of us now know him, but Mr. McCracken comes from a, a great background where he's been a project manager. He's retired from Herman Miller. But I, I want to, I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, but I had an opportunity to meet him and his wife. His wife is president of Kendall College. And that is, that is a, you know, outstanding institution in, in design. And she's also vice president at Ferris. Um, so I kind of think um, there might be some resources and that might be his outreach maybe for some, some support in some way. So I also agree that when they, when they first meet that um, they may decide that they need more members on it and that's an opportunity for us to hear what they have to say after they meet, do their organizational meeting and if they make a recommendation to increase it. They bring it to council and then we vote on it and amend the bylaws. So that would be the process going forward. And that's all at the end of my comments. Um, now we are going to go into consideration of a closed session union contract negotiations. City Manager William Gamble has requested a closed session this evening as permitted by the Michigan Open Meetings Act Section 8C. 
to discuss contract negotiations with the International Association of Firefighters. At this time, Council could take action to close session under Section 8C of the Michigan Open Meetings Act. I need a motion. I'll make a motion. I need a second. Four. Thank you. Vote. Councilmember Backman. Yes. Mayor Beaton. Yes. Councilmember Lundberg. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sullivan. Yes. Councilmember Shemansky. Yes. Councilmember Grabowski. Yes. Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yes. Motion approved. Thank you. Okay, so we are now returning to open session. I make a motion. We. I second. We. I need a motion to adjourn. Adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I'll second. 